I hope people uh, online can uh, hear me well as well. Um, so welcome to this uh, second and uh, last day of the EMGM. And I hope you, you enjoyed the conference so far. So today we'll continue with uh, a great program of talks and, and posters. Uh, and I'm, uh, hey, I'm Ellen Rufio, and uh, I'm part of the MRC Biostatistics Unit here in Cambridge. And I will be sharing the first session. Um, so for the first talk, we have the pleasure to have Nino Mounier from um, University of Lausanne. And uh, Nino will tell us about her method for correcting bias in uh, inverse variance weighted Mendelian randomization. So, Nino. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hélène. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to present this work today and to be able to do so in person. So I'm going to talk about how we can correct for winner scores and weak instrument bias uh, when using inverse variance weight in Mendelian randomization, even when there is a sample overlap. So I'm going to start with a few definitions, and we're going to start with inverse variance weight in Mendelian randomization. So I know there have already been several talks yesterday about Mendelian randomization, but I would still like to start with a very brief introduction. So Mendelian randomization, or MR, is a method that uses uh, genetic variants as instrumental variables, also called IVs, to assess the existence and the strength of the causal effect between two traits. So what we're interested in here, so let me just, yeah, it's the causal effect alpha between the exposure X and the outcome Y. So there are three main assumptions. Uh, the first one is the relevance assumptions, and it states that the IVs, denoted as G here, should be associated with the exposure X. The second assumption is the independent assumption, and it states that the IVs should not be associated with any constant of the XY relationship. This is the U variable here. And finally, the exclusion restriction assumption states that the IV should only be ex um, affecting the outcome Y through the exposure X, and there shouldn't be any other paths from G to Y. So there are two types of MR methods, one sample and two sample MR. I'm going to talk about two sample MR today. It's very popular because it only requires summary data, and more specifically, uh, GWAS summary statistics. So what we have here is that we uh, run a GWAS for the exposure X in sample A, and for each genetic variant, we'll get a method size estimate of a variant on the exposure, that's the beta X. And when doing a GWAS for the outcome in another sample B, we can look at the effect size of the estimate for the same genetic variant on the outcome. So these are the beta Y here. Here we're looking at a certain number of IVs that we selected based uh, for, uh, to satisfy the first assumption. So they're associated with the exposure. Um, so each IV provides a ratio estimate so to, to estimate the causal effect. So it's just the um, effect size estimate of the um, genetic variant on the outcome divided by the effect size estimate of the genetic variant on the exposure. And these ratio estimates, they can be meta-analyzed using an inverse variance weighted approach, so by using the corresponding weights here. And that gives us the IVW estimate that you can see here. And uh, the IVW method is like the most common MR method. So we're also going to talk about biases, and uh, we're going to talk about two sources of bias, weak instruments and winner scores. So weak instruments, uh, so weak instrument bias is well known in MR, and I think uh, the name of the bias already says a lot about what type of bias we're looking at here, and it occurs when you're using weak instruments. So it will become more severe when the average variance explained, of, uh, average variance explained for the exposure by the IVs decreases, and you can try to reduce the impact of weak instruments by using strong instruments, uh, using a stringent threshold to select the IVs, or by increasing the sample size for the exposure GWAS to get higher uh, values of variance explained. And the strength of the instrument is often assessed using the F statistics. So if you have F statistic large enough, you're assuming that your instruments are strong enough. And there are also specific methods that are dealing with weak instruments, such as MRWAPs. The second source of bias is uh, called winner's curse, and it occurs when a threshold is used to select the instruments. And in such a case, effect sizes tend to be overestimated. So one way to avoid winner's curse is to use two samples for the exposure. So one sample to select the instruments and one sample to estimate their effect sizes. This way you're getting rid of this correlation between an IV being selected and its effect being overestimated. But this means that 
here we're not using a two sample design anymore. We're using a three sample designs because we need two samples for the exposure and one sample for the outcome. So that's not always uh, really feasible in practice. So why do we care about these two sources of bias uh, in particular? It's because they are sample overlap dependent. So when you're using non-overlapping samples, so if you use two different set of individuals to run the GWAS for the exposure and the outcome, you don't have any sample overlap. And the bias induced by winner's curse and weakness instruments is towards the null, which is conservative. And it explains why when you're doing two sample MR, you're expected to use non-overlapping samples. But when you do have sample overlap, so if some of the individuals are used in both GWASs, the bias can go towards the observational correlation, which is the sum of the true causal effect that you want to estimate and some confounding effect. So why don't we just choose non-overlapping samples? So there are two reasons for this. Uh, first one is that most of the GWASs that are run nowadays, they are meta-analysis, so they are combining different cohorts, and it might be difficult to find exposure and outcome GWASs that are compatible and not using the same data. Uh, second reason is that it, by using non-overlapping samples, you're forced to use sometimes smaller GWASs and not the largest one that you could use. So for example, you have lots of um, GWASs run using UK Biobank, but you can't use UK Biobank for both the exposure and the outcome. So you can't use the largest GWAS. So the aim of our project was to better characterize how sample overlap affects we know and we can sum on bias and to provide a correction that we implemented in an approach that we called MRLAP. And here we're not talking about violation of standard MR assumptions, we're really talking about biases that are inherent to two-sample MR. So this means that our approach has the same assumption as IVW and the main MR assumption should still be satisfied. So um, we started with the IVW estimator and we modified it. So we wanted to account for the fact that the IVs that we're using, so the small hem here, They've been selecting using usually a threshold. So you need the effect size on the exposure to be larger than some value of t. And in the modified formula, we're not only looking at the IVs that we have been selecting, but we're looking at all the potential IVs that could have been selected, and we're plugging in this uh, selection event. And we want to look at the bias, so we need to get the expectation of this estimate. So this expectation can be analytically derived. I'm not going to detail this today. I will directly jump to the final formula that we end up with. But before, I just need to um, give you a bit more information about one assumption that we need to make and some of the parameters that we are going to need to be able to use the formula. So we need to make an assumption about the genetic architecture of the exposure X. So we are assuming a spike and slab distribution. So we are assuming that there is a proportion per X of causal genetic variants that are directly affecting the exposure, and the rest of the genome is not affecting the exposure at all. So this means that if you're looking at the effect size of a single genetic variant on the exposure, it will be a product of two variables. First one, it's just a zero of one if it's causal or not. And the second one is uh, the actual effect size, which we're assuming is coming from normal distribution, center on zero, and a variance sigma x squared. So these are the two parameters that we're going to need here. Uh, by x, the bridge density of x, and sigma x squared, which is the per genetic variant irritability, and it's directly related to the irritability of the trait H2x. The last parameter that we need uh, is coming from LD score regression. So I'm not going to tell you what LD score regression is or how it works. I'm just going to tell you that there is one parameter that is called lambda, and it's the cross-trait LD score intercept. And it's defined as this alpha plus rho, so that's the observational correlation, times the overlap between samples A and B, divided by the square root of the product of the sample sizes. And this is key to our approach, because often the overlap between samples A and B is not known, and being able to use lambda as a proxy is very convenient, because this can be easily uh, estimated using LD score regression. So uh, this is the final formula we end up with. Uh, it's quite complex, and I don't expect you to look at all the, um, the equations here. I just want to highlight two things. The first thing is that even though it's complex, all the parameters that are in this formula are parameters that I introduced before. So the expectation of the IVW estimator only depends on the exposure sample size, the threshold we use to select the IVs, this modified cross trait and this concept, so just lambda divided by the square root of the product of the sample sizes, uh, and the polygenicity and the per genetic variant irritability of X that we can estimate. The second thing that is uh, quite interesting is that there are actually two jumps in this expectation. And when there is no sample overlap, this lambda prime will be equal to zero. So we only have the first jump here. 
and it's equal to alpha times something. And we can show that this something is smaller than one. So this means that when there is no sample overlap, um, this will explain the bias towards the null for non-overlapping samples. When there is sample overlap, we're going to be adding this second term here. And this term will get larger as lambda prime uh, increases, so when sample overlap increases. And this is what is leading to the bias towards the observational correlation. Finally, with this formula, um, so these are the last two uh, pieces of equations that I have here, we can do two things. We can estimate the corrected effects, because all the parameters here, except the true causal effect alpha, are known or can be estimated from the data. So by taking this uh, true alpha out, we can get the corrected effect that we have here. And finally, we can test for the difference between the IVW effect and the corrected effect estimates, just using this um, t statistics here. So this is for the theory. And uh, what we first try is to assess how this method was working using simulations. So we needed real genetic data to be able to run LD score regression. So we used UK Biobank genetic data. And we simulated phenotypic data for the exposure X and for the outcome Y with different degrees of sample overlap between the two. We performed the GWAS for both traits to get the summary statistics. We used two, uh, two sample MR and we obtained the IVW effect estimate. And finally, we applied our approach to get the corrected effect estimate. So we um, used different scenarios and for each scenario, we repeated this 100 times. And these are the results for our first scenario here. So what uh, we do see in this plot is the mean causal effect estimate across the 100 simulations for this scenario. And we're looking at the IVW effect. So on the y-axis, we have the causal effect estimate. On the x-axis, we have the p-value threshold. The dotted line is the true causal effect that we simulated. And the different lines of different colors correspond to different degrees of sample overlap. So <clears throat> we can see that we have quite big differences depending on sample overlap. And when you're using non-overlapping samples, so that's the lighter line, we have a strong underestimation of the causal effect. And as sample overlap increases, so the lines get darker, and we end up with some overestimation of the causal effect if we use uh, fully overlapping samples. If we use the same data and apply our approach to get the corrected effect, this is what this looks like. So here we don't have so big differences between uh, the different degrees of sample overlap anymore, and we're able to get something uh, much closer to a true causal effect in all the um, uh, cases for all the values of sample overlap. We also simulated data when there is no causal effect. So here we set alpha to zero, and we wanted to look at the false positive rate. So how many times um, from the Android simulations do we find a significant causal effect when there is actually no significant causal effect? So on the left side, we have the results for IVW. On the right side, we have the results for the corrected effect. And uh, we have for different p-value thresholds, again, and for different degrees of sample overlap on the y-axis. So for IVW, when you're using non-overlapping sample, which is what you're supposed to do, uh, the values are well um, are below 5%, so this is fine. But if you increase sample overlap, you can get high false positive rate, which is a problem. However, for corrected effects, we have better control of false positive rates when there is sample overlap, which is what we expect and what we wanted to do. Uh, when we wanted to look at real data, we decided to first choose a sampling strategy because we don't know what the true causal effect is, but we were still interested in seeing how it will vary depending on sample overlap. So what we did is that we used UK Biobank again, took genetic and phenotypic data for different traits, and we sampled uh, 100,000 individuals for the exposure, 100,000 individuals for the outcome, and we made the degree of sample overlap vary between the exposure and the outcome. And then we just used the same pipeline as before to get the IVW and the corrected effect estimate. So these are the results for the effect of uh, body mass index on systolic blood pressure. So here we selected the instrument using a p-value threshold of 5 to minus 8. And in the tables, for the different degree of sample overlap, we are looking at the IVW effect estimate and standard error, the corrected effect estimate and standard error, and the p-value when testing for the difference between IVW and the corrected effect. And here we can see that we have a significant difference only for non-overlapping samples. And in this case, the IVW effect is uh, smaller than the corrected effect because we have this bias towards the null when using non-overlapping samples. If we look at another um, at other traits, so in this case it's BMI on alcohol consumptions. We again selected the instruments in the same threshold and the table is very similar. But we see a different pattern for the p-value for the difference. 
here we have a significant difference for all degrees of sample overlap. And this means that for non-overlapping sample, it will be biased towards the null, but for fully overlapping sample, it will also be biased downwards because the observational correlation is smaller than the causal effect that we're estimating. And this is indicating the existence of a confounder acting in the opposite direction. And in this case, uh, all the corrected effects, they are much more similar and they are all pointing towards a stronger causal effect. <coughs> Finally, um, still looking at real data, we wanted to look at more traits and more pairs. So we used a UK Biobank uh, summary statistic from the NILS group, and we looked at 17 traits. So for all these traits, we looked at the pairwise relationships between them, so that means 272 relationships. Uh, the exact degree of sample overlap uh, varies depending on the missing data for each trait, but it's overall quite high, and it's very close to uh, fully overlapping samples. So for all these relationships, we calculated the uh, IVW estimate, the corrected effect estimate, and we tested for the difference between the two. So we identified uh, 60 uh, relationships with a p-value for the difference that was significant after correcting for multiple testing. And among these 60, 41 um, were corresponding to pairs where we have at least one of the two causal effects that were significant. So we're going to focus on this 41, where they are significantly different from each other and significantly different from zero. And if we're plotting the corrected effect estimate against the IVW uh, effect estimate, this is what this looks like. So the um, dotted line is just the identity line, so if they were equal, they will be on the line. Uh, and we can see, uh, again, two things. First thing is that all the pairs that have a name written here they have a relative difference larger than 15%. So this means that we have quite big uh, discrepancies between the IVW estimate and the corrected effect estimate. And for about half of them, which are the ones in purple here, the IVW effect was smaller than the corrected effect estimate. So IVW was underestimating the causal effect even though we were using fully overlapping samples. So this is similar to the BMI uh, alcohol consumption that we were seeing before. So I um, presented this work where we wanted to better understand and characterize the relationship between uh, sample overlap, win of scores, and weak instrument bias. So we developed this approach called MRLAP, which is just an IVW correction, but only requires summary statistics and can account for unknown degree of sample overlap. It can be used <coughs> to uh, detect and correct for potential biases. And we're hoping by, that by being able to use overlapping samples, you can get um, Fully, like we can use larger sample sizes and therefore increase the fiscal power in MR analysis. So if you're interested in this work, we have a preprint on BioArchive and we implemented the approach in an R package on GitHub. And with this, I would like to thank um, Zoltan Kudalik, who supervised this project, the statistical genetics groups in Lausanne, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the interesting talk. Are there any questions for Nino? Yeah. Thank you for this talk. Um, I have just a small question about the simulations. Could you perhaps give him a little bit more detail how you simulated the phenotype? Yes. Uh, so, we're, uh, so we do have the genetic data, so we select it from randomly, um, so we take random UK Biobank individuals from the unrelated British, and we set up 1.1 million SNP. And then we're assuming that uh, the exposure, it will be equal to the genotypes times the SNP effect sizes, which are coming from uh, this distribution that I presented, so they are causal or not causal, and the um, uh, effect size, size, like the actual size depends on this normal distribution and the irritability of the trait. We are adding some uh, confounding effects. So U is just like a normal amount of confounding factor. So we're simulating like a random variables, um, zero, one. And we have this kappa X factor, which will be the um, size, like the effect size of the confounding on the exposure, plus some uh, noise to get some, something like, um, to get the variance of X to one. And for the outcome, we're taking alpha, so the causal effect, times the exposure that we calculated before. Again, we can add um, genetic effects like pleiotropy and direct effects on the, of the SNP of the genetic variance on the outcome. 
we're adding the effect of a confounder and again some noise and that's what we end up with yeah thank you nicely prepared slide here <laughs> Uh, so we have a question on Zoom from Clive. Clive, would you like to unmute and say your question, please? Okay. Hi. Um, I just I think MTAG also uses LD score to estimate sample overlap. Did you did you look at that at all? So MTAG, they are not using that causal relationships, right? They're just looking, trying to re-estimate the effect sizes of the SNPs on two or more different traits by leveraging this um, correlation. So that's okay. a bit different from what we're doing. But are you using LD score in, a, in the same way or a similar way as, as MTAG? Yes, we want to get this uh, observational correlation and sample overlap from L score regression. Okay. And in terms of um, winner's curse, I mean, why not just use some kind of <clears throat> more sort of standard shrinkage method to deal with that? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I mean, winner's curse is often just is often dealt with by using a shrinkage type method. Ah, yeah. yeah, you'll just reduce the effect size that you'll just. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, what, why not? Right. I mean, how, how does? Yeah, I mean, yeah. How does your method actually induce shrinkage here, or why not just use shrink shrinkage? So here we're not correcting the SNP effect sizes directly. We're actually directly correcting the MR estimate. So that's a different way of doing it. Instead of looking at the SNP effect sizes, we decided to directly correct the IVW estimator. So these are two different approaches. Mm, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think we need to move on to the next talk. Um, so thank you, Nino. Um, so for the second talk, we have Martha Rasmussen from uh, the University of Copenhagen. And uh, Martha will present a um, method for estimating the side, uh, the side frequency spectrum um, from low depth and left depth sequencing data. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Mel. I want to talk about how to infer the side frequency spectrum from low depth sequencing data. And just no, no, oh, too much. There. Just to begin. What is the side frequency spectrum, or SFS, as we often call it? And why do we care about it? The side frequency spectrum is the distribution of allele frequencies in a sample from a population of interest. So what I'm showing you here is a figure I borrowed from a colleague showing you the side frequency spectrum or SFS from four different human populations. You have Nigerians, East Asians, Europeans, and Greenlanding Inuit. You have 10 individuals from each. So along the x-axis here, if you have 10 individuals, you're going to have at each side between 0 and 20 derived alleles corresponding to an allele frequency, right? So if you have 10 out of 20, that's going to be a frequency of 0.5, 4, that's going to be a frequency of 0.2, and so on. Then along the y-axis, you have the proportion of sites in these samples that have the corresponding frequency. So you see, for instance, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, you see that this in this Nigerian population, around 0.32 or so of the variant sites, they have only one out of 20 of the alleles being derived. That's the slightly lower for these Asian Europeans and lower still for the Greenland Inuit. Why do you care about this? Because the shape of the spectrum you can see they have different shapes with different populations. It tells you something, for instance, about demographic history. So you can see bottlenecks and expansions and stuff like this. So you can use it for inference, like this is a summary statistic that's used a lot in population genetics. We can also do this in 2D. So here I've borrowed um, a figure from a publication looking at altitude adaptation in Tibetans. So along the x-axis here, you have um, derived alleles 0 to 100 for 50 Tibetan individuals. You have 40 Han Chinese individuals here. And then you have the proportion of sites corresponding to the various combination of counts, colored in kind of color going out, right? And here's not proportions, raw counts, but we could normalize, get, get the same. And what you see is that these populations are quite similar. Most of the mass lies along the diagonal. So variants that are rare in Han, they're rare in Tibet. Variants that are rare in Tibet, common in Tibet, they tend to be common in Han. Here, the authors use this to look at selection, and they argue that this E plus 1 variant is actually involved in altitude adaptation. You see that it's quite common in the Tibetans, but it's rather rare in the Han. It's another thing you can do. Right, so that's briefly what it is, why you care about it. You can do this for lots of, do inference with this for lots of stuff in PubChem. 
problem is it's quite easy to get an SFS if you have great genotypes. If you have low depth data or you have noise of other sorts, then it's well known that you get a bias. So I'm showing you here some previous results from a paper, 2013. What I want you to see is that in these, in the left row and in the middle row, you have psi frequency spectrum and colors from various ways of calling genotypes compared to truth in gray. What you should see is for 2x data, this row, and 5x data, you get a bias. The SFS is biased compared to truth, and that's true up until around 10x is a normal kind of rule of thumb. That does not happen if you use a genotype likelihood-based method, which is on the right here, which is then basically what you have to do if you have load updates, and you can have that, right? You might work with ancient samples, you might not have a lot of money. There are many reasons why you might have low depth data. Then you have to do a, a genotype likelihood based method. And I'll be showing you what that looks like, what some of the problems with the current method is, is and how we've attempted to solve that. Right. Genotype likelihoods, probability of our data given a particular genotype for some individual at some site, right? So we have some data, some genotype. I'll be encoding genotypes as 0, 1, 2, corresponding to the number of derived alleles at this site. So we might have for a particular individual 1 at a particular site J. You know, we might ask what is the likelihood um, given a genotype 0. And I'll try and be a bit visual. So let's represent that, right, with this kind of green pentagon here. That's whatever value this is. And we could ask the same question for genotype 1 and genotype 2. So this means that for each site, for each individual, we have this kind of triplet of likelihoods that we can calculate, and then we can use those instead of calling genotypes, right? The, the, you'd usually use those to actually call genotypes. When we do this for a different individual, I've used brown here. For the SFS, we're going to need the generalization of this to frequencies. So instead, we're going to ask, what is the probability of our data given a particular sum of genotypes in our sampled individuals? Which again corresponds to frequency, right? If you get a sum of 10 out of 20 alleles, well, that's a frequency of 0.5. This looks a bit tedious if you write it up in closed form, but just to give you an idea of what this looks like, right? If we ask, well, how are we going to get a sum of genotypes of zero, this red square here? Well, that's going to involve getting a zero genotype, sort of the corresponding likelihood in each individual, right? If you ask, how am I going to get a sum of genotypes of one, this red square with a one here? Well, you could have, you know, a zero genotype one and a one in the other, or you could have a one and one and zero in the other, and we need to keep some kind of combinatoric constants here in mind. But the idea is not that simple, at least for the case with two individuals here, where this goes from zero up to two and a four. In general, it, it, kind of, it gets more involved, but the idea is the same. Final piece of the puzzle here is that we're going to need a conditional frequency posterior. So this is the probability of the sums, the frequencies that we just looked at, conditional on an SFS, a side frequency spectrum, and our data. This is going to, this is modeled so that this ends up being proportional to the frequency likelihoods, this generalization of genotype likelihoods that we just looked at, and the SFS, which I'm showing here with these blue diamonds. So this would be the proportion of sites that have zero derived, one derived, two derived, and so on. Again, I'm just showing two individuals here, so that you get that this posterior, conditional posterior, is element-wise proportional to the product of frequency likelihoods and the SFS. With that, I can introduce to you the standard method, method for getting the SFS from low depth frequency data, which is an expectation maximization algorithm. This is iterative optimization. And I'm just going to do this visually. So let's say now we, we've pre calculated all these frequency likelihoods from the genotype likelihoods that we have from our data. This will be possible frequencies along here. And we have all our sites along here, right? And in the general case for genome scale data, you're going to have hundreds of millions, maybe billions of sites along here. Then you've guessed an SFS already in the beginning, you can go for arbitrary, and you can visualize kind of sliding the SFS across the data, calculating at each site the conditional posterior. We do this all the way across. And at the end, we can take the row sums of this matrix, normalize those to probability scale, and we get a new SFS. And by the properties of the EM algorithm, this SFS is guaranteed to have higher log likelihood than the previous one. So we can repeat this process until convergence. In general, this method works quite well, but it has some problems. One problem is it requires tens or hundreds of these passes through the data that I'm going to call epochs. This means if you have genome scale data, runtime of hours or days, right, which is inconvenient. 
But the real problem with that is that because you need to look at your data so many times, you actually need to keep your frequency like if it's in RAM. That means that you need hundreds of gigabytes to do this stuff, right? So maybe if you have a big server, you can block that out for days, but you know, maybe you don't, right? Which means a lot of people, they end up having to, they're simply not able to get a reliable SFS estimate for that data. And right, we, that's not desirable. We're not sequencing genome scale data to downsample it and not get the full value of that data. So that's a problem. The final problem, which I'm going to mention now and then return to is that this is prone to overfitting. And I'll show you what that looks like a bit later, but keep that in mind, right? And in some sense, the solution to this is kind of obvious, or at least the kind of in, in, in outline, there's an easy solution, right? We don't want to have to calculate all these posteriors. We don't want to look at all the data all along the genome before making update step, steps on our estimate. What we would like to do is kind of do this in batches of updates as we go along, saves us time. This is known as stochastic EM. And as the challenge with this is that there is a trade-off here between if you update very often, you could update at each side in theory, you're going to converge to an estimate very fast, but you're going to have a lot of noise. So you need to balance how, how often to update and how much noise. And in practice, that means there is a cottage industry of methods in this field for kind of fancy schemes of updating often and then looking back in time somehow to see how can we keep the estimate stable. You might be familiar with maybe stochastic EM, but also the same ideas are in stochastic gradient descent with Adam and RMS prop and all these methods that some of you might know. So, and I tried all of those methods in the beginning of those projects. I tried all those methods, all those schemes. I found that for this domain, I think there are various reasons that they don't work very well. In fact, they work quite poorly. So we came up with something different, quite simple thing actually, that I think works quite well. I'm going to show, show this again visually. So we're going to break up again, these are frequency likelihoods sites along here, frequencies along here. We're going to break that up into blocks. Now I've chosen five here, that would be a hyperparameter. Break it up into five blocks. Here there are four sites in each that would be much larger in practice. Then we're going to shuffle along this dimension to kind of get rid of any problems with LD. And now let's imagine we jump in here, we've estimated site frequency spectra for the first three blocks, right? Last three, that's also hyperparameter, how many we go back, but let's ignore that for now. Then we're simply going to say, all right, let me take the element wise average of these past three guesses and make this intermediate estimate that I'm going to use. I'm going to use this averaged estimate to calculate my posteriors for this next block. Then with that block, I can do the same trick of taking the rows I'm here, normalizing them, and I get a new estimate for this particular block. I repeat this trick take the average of that, calculate my posteriors for the next block. That gives me a, a new update. We're simply going to wrap around. I can take the average, I can calculate the posteriors, I can get a new estimate, I can get a new mean, and so on. And notice now that in the span of one epoch, one pass over my data, I've actually updated my estimate five times already. We find that this very simple scheme actually works really quite well for this domain. So I'm going to show you some results of this. This is, I've run this on some Impala data that some of my colleagues have, which Impala is some kind of um, antelope. It's a non-model organism, so bad reference genome. I have three X data here, so rather low. It's contaminated, there's all kinds of noise in this data. So this is exactly when you'd need an approach like this. And here I'm showing you the result of the standard EM algorithm. Remember that was where we went all along. That's the current de facto standard for doing the stuff, often implemented in this real SFS software that exists. I'm showing you how the SFS estimates look after 10 passes through the data, after 40 passes through the data, and after 100 passes through the data, at which point the algorithm has converged. And I hope you agree with me that at least 10 passes is not enough, right? We have a large difference here between 10 and the final estimate. Likewise, actually, for 40 epochs, we get the same problem. So you need upwards of 100 passes through the data to do this stuff reliably. That's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of RAM like we talked about. Now compare this with this window-based methods. I've implemented this in something called WinSFS Win because of the windows. We split the genome here in 500 blocks, average over the last 100 estimates. And I'm showing you here the estimates after one pass, three passes, and five passes. And what I hope you agree with me is we get a really good estimate here after three epochs. I'm showing you in the black dots here, the, the converged standard approach, right? So what you'll see is that after three epochs here, 
we get basically the same estimate as 100. So that's kind of a 30 fold reduction in runtime, except down here, right? You might say, well, that's not quite the same here. And that's true. But biologically, we expect that the side frequency spectrum should be smooth, right? It would be weird if the frequencies were kind of wobbly like this. So this is likely the effect of overfitting. And we've actually smoothed that out by averaging over previous blocks. So this kind of induces some kind of regularization, defeats some of this overfitting. That gets even more significant if we do this in 2D. So here I'm showing you the result of the standard EM method. Again, this real SSS software for two of these impala populations, right? Now along here, and the frequencies are going out. The main thing I want you to notice about this plot is the checkerboarding, right? Again, it's non-trivial to say what the shape of the spectrum should be, but it should not have holes in it. So this we don't like. We do not expect this biologically. And this is, again, after 100 epochs, so this would take days. It would take hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Instead, if we use this method, this window method, this is after two epochs that has all been smoothed out. And I could try and, you know, dizzy you by going back and forth here to convince you that it's otherwise the same. It would be easier if I just showed you the difference. So the differences are here. With white, meaning no difference between the methods. And recall that this was two passes versus 50 passes. And the main thing I want you to notice here is that there seems to be no kind of systematic bias here. We have no area of this plot that's all blue, that's all red, suggest suggesting that the main difference is actually in the smoothing out this thing that we consider to be overfitting. Oh. And it, that's very little. The, I think the reason why this happens is there's very, very little information in here, right? Despite the fact that I have around 600 million sites here, there are very, very, very few of them that lie in here. Maybe, you know, there are two, 300 sites in many of these bins, which means there's very little information. And this gets very prone to overfitting if you look at all the data at once. That leads me to my conclusion, which is that I hope to have convinced you that this window SFS method EM variant provides a better estimate of the SFS. And in doing so, it requires significantly fewer computational resources. I want to remind you, this isn't just a nicety, right? It's nice to go from using days to using an hour. But the main thing is actually that this would allow you to run this stuff out of RAM, run it on disk, which means that we go from requiring hundreds of gigabytes of RAM to constant memory usage, which means that this actually this enables us to do this stuff on data where it wasn't possible before which is nice. Um, then I should say, if anyone's interested in this stuff, I've implemented it in Rust, it's my GitHub. I'm still playing around There's kind of questions of, you know, how, when, when do you stop iterative optimization, stopping rules and so on, and getting it to run out of RAM. But it's kind of there and it works. And then thank you to people who've helped out on this. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Very nice uh, visual talk. Uh, any question, maybe one quick question. Hi, thanks for the great talk, really great explanation, very visual. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first about the frequency spectrum, why should it be smooth? Because if a population goes through a bottleneck, you probably would see some fluctuations, right? I mean, so if you have very, very little data, sure, right? But in general, the bottleneck will kind of flatten the spectrum, but it's kind of weird to have a lot of sites with frequency, you know, 0.55 and a lot with 0.6 and then none with 0.57 you know, five, five, or whatever was in between. That's kind of intuitively, that seems weird, right? If you have good data and good methods and so Right. On. Yeah, I agree. Um, but the second question, maybe sort of tangential related, if you use your window and you have outside of your window, but still an LD with SNPs in your window, does that not affect your analysis? So it snips outside my window? Yeah, so, or variants outside your window? No, so the current, the window going past, they will, I mean, they'll only be affected because the averaging, the averaging keeps some information, right? So the last, win, the last SFS in your window will have seen further back, so it kind of trails along in that sense, gets pop, propagated through the averaging, as it were, okay. and then decays backwards. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I think we need to, to move on. Maybe if you have other questions, keep them for the break. And the next talk is um, by Apostolos Yatimis. So Apostolos will tell us about um, addressing uh, selection bias 
in the organization. Hello, um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to present my work here. Um, I am going to talk about selection bias in Italian randomization studies. Uh, and uh, the work that I will present is joint work with my line manager, Kate Tilling, at the University of Bristol, uh, who I'm really thankful to. And we have also had some input by Eric Chetton. Chetton. So, um, Selection bias is a common uh, concern in epidemiological studies, and this includes Mendelian randomization, among other things. Uh, so in this talk, we will examine selection bias as a missing data problem uh, and uh, see how uh, we can use methods proposed in econometrics to address it. Uh, so as a sort of introduction to the missing data literature, there are uh, usually um, three types of uh, missing data discussed. The first is when data are missing completely at random. This means that effectively uh, when you have a study with some missing data, then the data you observe are exactly the same as the ones you miss, so you don't really need to worry about missingness. Uh, and the second ty type is data missing at random, which means that uh, there is some sort of pattern in what data are missing from the study, uh, but you have enough information by the variables that you observe in order to model this selection process. Uh, and this is usually what we assume when implementing methods such as inverse probability weighting or imputation to adjust for uh, missing data. Uh, but the third case is when data are missing not at random, in which case uh, you cannot adequately model the missingness process uh, in the study and you usually need more data or strong assumptions. Uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, selection bias. So for the third case, which will be of interest here, um, in the, it has been proposed in econometrics to use what is effectively uh, instrumental variables for the selection process uh, in order to adjust for missingness. So we will, um, we will review this approach here and then extend it to Mendelian randomization. And to do that, we will need access to individual level data, which is uh, sometimes um, not possible in MR, but we will assume uh, that it is possible throughout the stock. So uh, let's start by reviewing the um, uh, methods for missing not at random data in um, an observational setting. So here I will not assume any form of uh, causal uh, model. I will just assume that I have a covariate X and an outcome Y, and I want to examine where, whether the covariate is associated with the outcome. And I will assume that I have a particular form of missingness uh, in that I have fully observed the covariate, uh, but I have missing values for the outcome for some individuals in my study. And I will let R denote a selection indicator so that for individual I, I observe the outcome if Ri equals one, and I do not observe it if Ri equals zero. Uh, and in such a case, if the outcome itself affects the chance of observing the outcome, I have data missing at random. So you can think of maybe the outcome being some sort of uh, depression or um, drug usage uh, outcome where individuals who are depressed or use drugs are much, more, much less likely to agree to participate in a study. So depending on how I am collecting my data, I may have uh, data missing at random. And so the main idea for this is that if I can find a variable thread, that is uh, associated with the selection process, with participation into the study, but not with the main analysis that they want to implement, I can use it as an external source of information to address um, the uh, presence of missing data. So uh, Z, I will call an instrument for selection from now on. And in order to be an instrument, it must satisfy our uh, version of the instrumental variable assumptions. And in this case, we will have only two assumptions. The first one is that Z must be uh, associated with the uh, selection process. That is the equivalent of the relevance assumption in uh, normal uh, instrumental variable analysis. And the second assumption is I don't want Z to associate with the outcome of my analysis conditional on covariates. So that is the form of exclusion restriction assumption. And of course, I also need some modeling assumptions if I am to progress. 
So the first person using these instruments for selection uh, for uh, the purpose of adjusting for selection bias was James Heckman in the 70s, who essentially considered a parametric uh, model uh, along those lines. So Heckman assumed a uh, linear regression for a normally distributed outcome. Um, and uh, he combined that with a probit uh, model for the selection process. So uh, the, the, the selection coefficient Ri takes uh, value 0, 1 according to some latent continuous uh, variable Yri. Uh, and for this uh, linear regression slash probit selection model, Heckman showed that the uh, mean uh, outcome value among individuals with observed data is equal to xi transpose beta, which is the linear term that we want to estimate, plus this bias term CLI, uh, which um, um, the only thing that we really want to, to, to care about it is that you can estimate it from the probit regression model. Uh, and you can actually fit the probit regression model because you know the uh, selection indicator for all individuals. Uh, so this Li is, some, lambda I is sometimes called the inverse Mills ratio in the uh, Heckman work. Uh, so effectively what you can do here is you can rely on this relationship uh, to link the uh, mean outcome value among observed, uh, among individuals with observed outcome with the parameter that you want to estimate. So this lends itself to a two-stage process where first you fit the probit regression for R, uh, estimate the inverse Mills ratios, and then you plug them into the uh, model for the outcome among the observed individuals, uh, among the individuals with observed data, sorry, uh, and you can estimate beta from that model. Uh, now, uh, this uh, work by Heckman has become uh, quite popular in the literature and a number of people have used it and also started uh, discussing extensions since Heckman's model uh, is uh, tied to a specific set of parametric, parametric assumptions. Uh, people have uh, proposed extensions and some of them have been in the form of uh, other parametric models, but while some of them have been more general, uh, now, of course, I don't have the time to talk through every uh, possible extension, so we focused on one particular extension, which was proposed by Eric Chetkin-Chetkin and Catherine Wirth in a paper from 2017. Um, so this is a um, sort of unifying framework for uh, fitting a number of different models, which I will illustrate here for linear regression. Uh, these sort of general um, extensions of Heckman's model typically need some additional assumptions to guarantee parameter identification. So for uh, the work of Chetgen, Chetgen and Wirth, uh, the additional assumption goes as follows. If you define this function delta to be basically the mean difference in outcomes among individuals with observed outcome values and non-observed outcome values, this is sort of a measure of the magnitude of selection bias uh, for this linear regression problem. Uh, then uh, in chat in and work require this function to uh, be a function of the covariates in the analysis, but not the instrument for selection, uh, which is a bit uh, difficult to grasp. Uh, one, if you are willing to make these assumptions, um, then effectively uh, you can obtain a formula similar to that from the Heckman's work where you can model the um, mean outcome value among individuals with observed outcomes uh, in terms of the uh, linear term x transpose beta that you want to estimate plus additional um, terms that are dependent on this selection bias uh, quantification delta of x plus the propensity score uh, pi of x and z. Uh, and so effectively, you have a way of estimating the parameter beta uh, for the uh, full data regression uh, using only the observed data by fitting a regression model where delta and pi take the same uh, role as the inverse Mills ratio in Heckman's work. Um, except this is not something you can do with a two-stage process. Uh, but you have to rely on maximum likelihood estimation and in order to run maximum likelihood estimation you also have to have some sort of additional assumption on the form of the selection function and the propensity score. 
Um, and for linear regression, you might think that this is just more complicated than Heckman's original work, but the nice thing about it is that you can extend it straightforwardly uh, to other models, including a logistic regression, Poisson regression, you can model nonlinear functions instead of X transpose beta, uh, and you can do a bunch of different things. So uh, the first thing we wanted to do is to assess how these methods perform in a simulation study. Uh, so we generated uh, uh, data according to this uh, diagram here. Uh, we let beta y be the parameter that we are trying to estimate, the association between the covariate and the outcome. We let everything be normally distributed except the selection coefficient, uh, and we specified values for the selection effects. Uh, and we compared the uh, two instruments for selection methods uh, with complete case analysis and IPW, which is what people would usually do uh, to, uh, to uh, adjust for selection bias. So in our baseline simulation, this is sort of what we got. So here the, the brown confidence interval corresponds to an oracle estimate, so it's of course uh, correct. Uh, and uh, complete case analysis and IPW were both biased in this case, so they should be biased if we have data missing not at random and a non-straightforward uh, model. Um, and quite worryingly, they were biased in the same way. So if you were actually using IPW here, you might have increased reasons to feel confident that you have no selection bias. Uh, while the uh, two uh, instruments for selection approaches, both Heckman's method and the TTW method, were able to recover the um, true uh, value of the regression coefficient. Uh, the price that you need to pay is that you have lower precision by both methods and therefore also lower power. Uh, but on a positive note, uh, the uh, coverage properties of uh, both methods were actually fine uh, and they are fine throughout in the um, simulations we run, so I will focus on confidence intervals from now on. So then we started varying the simulation design in a number of ways. The original simulation had a normally distributed um, um, variables. So what if we have a binary variable for the instrument or for the covariate? This didn't make a difference. Uh, a binary outcome or a Poisson outcome, this changes the modeling assumption here. So Heckman's uh, method, which assumes a normally distributed model, of course, um, struggled, but the TTW method was actually uh, fine. Um, I should say that um, the um, R implementation for Heckman's method that we used uh, supposedly can model binary outcomes, but uh, we found that the, uh, it did not perform very well uh, in that case. Uh, it was still less biased than the uh, other methods, though. Uh, we then started playing with the structure of the causal diagram uh, and we uh, basically started adding or removing arrows. What if you have only one of the covariate and the outcome affecting selection? Well, that is still fine and in fact there is less bias for the uh, established approaches, uh, IPW and uh, complete case analysis. Uh, we also uh, added an effect of the instrument on the covariate, which actually doesn't violate any assumptions, uh, and indeed our methods remained biased. Uh, the methods were biased, though, when we added a direct effect of the instrument for selection on the outcome, which is essentially uh, a violation of the IV assumptions here, so that is the uh, instruments for selection version of pleiotropy, and naturally uh, the uh, IV cell methods were biased. Uh, and finally, we played with instrument strength, uh, and this is instrument strength for varying degrees, and what you will notice here is that, of course, a weaker instrument meant uh, more uncertainty about our parameter estimate, but there was no bias uh, even for relatively weak instruments, uh, and this is because weak instruments bias in MR is a result of trying to estimate a ratio, uh, while here we're estimating a single parameter, so even for a weak instrument, you can still get an unbiased estimate, you just uh, get higher uncertainty about it. Okay, so how do we go about uh, using these approaches to Mendelian randomization? Um, I think enough people have introduced MR in this conference that I don't need to do the same here, uh, but from now on I will assume that X is an exposure and Y is an outcome and I want to assess the effect of X and Y uh, and I have an instrument for inference that I will call G in order to do this. 
Uh, now, the MR design allows you to not worry about confounding bias, but as mentioned earlier, it is uh, still susceptible to selection bias. Um, and so, uh, imagine that I am in the same state as before, and I have a selection indicator R, and I want to find a second instrument uh, or selection, like it said, uh, with which to adjust for selection bias here. Uh, and uh, in this case, I will uh, relax my uh, assumptions about what is missing and say that I can have missing values for either the exposure or the outcome, uh, or both, uh, while previously I only had missing values for the outcome. So, uh, how do you do MR? Well, if you have a single instrument for inference, so that is a single G, be it a single SNP or a polygenic score, uh, then you use a world est uh, estimate, uh, which is essentially uh, with individual data that I'm assuming here, you would regress uh, G on X and then G on Y, and then, and then take the ratio estimate between those two. Um, and so essentially all you need here is unbiased estimates of the GX and GY associations. Uh, and if you have no missing data, then your standard least squares or whatever other approach can give you those unbiased estimates. So if you do have missing data on either the, uh, the exposure or the outcome, the only thing you need to do here is just replace the OLS fits or whatever other fit you use uh, to obtain the summary statistics with a fit uh, using the instruments for selection method methods, either Heckman's method or TDW. Uh, and you will straightforwardly be able to get an unbiased uh, estimate of the world ratio, which is nice. Uh, now, what if you have multiple instruments for uh, inference, so say have uh, a number of different SNPs uh, in a two sample design, the most straightforward thing to do is, uh, is to just like take each SNP and uh, compute its summary statistics separately using uh, OLS or IBSL, uh, depending on whether you have missing data for it, uh, and then combine these uh, using IBW. IV, IVW. Uh, so this will give me a set of sort of missingness adjusted summary statistics, which uh, I guess I could use in a number of different ways. Then I could maybe use uh, to implement the other robust methods uh, or um, uh, do other things. We haven't fully really explored this, but uh, it's uh, it's basically lending itself to using all the um, summary statistics methods from MR. But this requires a two-sample design. So what if you have one sample design, which is much more common with individual level data? Well, you could adapt the two-stage least squares process to just uh, fit uh, either the first or the second stage uh, using a um, Heckman's uh, model implementation or a TW implementation. Uh, and you would still get uh, a, a reasonable uh, process that gives you an unbiased estimate of the causal effect. The bad thing is you wouldn't immediately be able to extend the standard error calculation for the two stages the squares process, uh, and you would just like the, the formula would break down, and you would be able to to account for uncertainty in the first stage regression if you were using uh, instruments for selection. So instead, you would need to bootstrap the whole process. And if you have many SNPs, that's a high dimensional optimization problem that you'd need to bootstrap. So this is quite intense computationally. So sometimes it may be better to just take, uh, like take the SNPs and put them together in a polygenic score uh, and um, then use the world ratio estimates. Uh, so I think I'm running out of time. So I will very quickly go through the simulations we ran for the MR setting. Um, so we basically implemented this with three different process selection uh, mechanisms, whether the outcome or the exposure or both affect uh, selection. And once again, we were able to get unbiased estimates uh, of the causal effect at the expense of higher uncertainty, especially for the TTW method. Um, and this is for many SNPs. So at some point, the TTW method starts uh, um, becoming a bit unstable due to the high uncertainty. Uh, but I don't really have the time to explain everything. Do I have two more minutes? So one, one minute. Okay, very quickly, we tried to um, to run an application to assess this. So we took data from the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, 
uh, which is a cohort uh, collected in Bristol with uh, children born in 1991-92. Uh, and we tried to assess the effects of VMI on smoking in this data set, um, which uh, is, of course, uh, subject to a lot of missing data. Um, so uh, we used an instrument for BMI from a recent GWAS and for smoking we considered a number of different instruments for selection. Uh, first of all, they had an RCT for participation uh, where basically they invited people to participate in the questionnaire collection that measured smoking habits by either sending them an online reminder or sending them the reminder plus uh, an printed questionnaire. So this is a nice instrument for selection because it affects participation but nothing else. So we use that as an instrument, or, or alternatively, we used uh, genetic variants associated with participation from either ALSPAC itself or UK Biobank, uh, and this is what we got. So for smoking status, uh, we basically didn't observe an effect, although most, most methods were actually uh, giving a positive estimate, while for the number of cigarettes, we observed an effect. So um, the, the high um, uncertainty of the TTW method is really hurting it here, but Heckman gives us more or less the same results as the established approaches, which is nice. Uh, and if we want to try to interpret results, well, uh, Lawrence Howe and co-authors conducted a similar investigation and said that BMI affected basically individuals' early onset smoking, so at ages 16 or 17. Uh, our uh, analysis was age 20. Uh, and uh, how and co-authors did not find an effect there. So at least this is in line with our results and our analysis suggests that their finding is not likely to be because of selection bias. Uh, now, if we want to place this into perspe perspective, uh, the, there have been other studies suggesting that BMI also has a uh, higher um, uh, impact on smoking at the different ages, some of them using larger data sets. So maybe this is low power because Alspot is a fairly small data set, which would also explain why number of cigarettes has an association. It's a uh, count outcome, so higher power there. Uh, ideally, we would need to study this uh, relationship in a, um, a, across time, uh, but we, uh, we thought that we should stop it here uh, since this is an application for a methods paper. So I will conclude here. Uh, thank you very much. Quite strict, uh, strict schedule. So, uh, unless there is a, one pressing question, I would suggest that we keep the questions for the break and move on to the next uh, speaker. So, thank you, Apostolos. Okay, thank you. And the next speaker is actually uh, online, so it will be a virtual talk um, by Ashish Patel. Uh, from the MRC Biostatistics Unit, and Ashish will tell us about uh, conditional inference in cis Mendelian normalization using weak genetic factors. Okay, thanks. Um, so, this is work with Dependa Gill, Paul Newcomb, and Steve Burgess. Um, and we've been looking at this problem of how to do inference in a cis Mendelian randomization. Um, so uh, this is where the MR analysis focuses on a particular gene region uh, of interest. Um, and in this setting, we might be more concerned than usual about problems of uh, weak instruments. Um, and that's for a few reasons. Uh, first is that you cannot just select uh, the most strongly associated variants from anywhere because you're focusing on a, a particular uh, location. Um, also thinking about the, um, uh, the two sample problem, um, sorry, is the screen being shared? Yes, it is. We can okay. see your screen. Great. Okay. Um, so also thinking about the two sample problem, uh, you might be using genetic associations um, from um, studies which have much smaller sample size than uh, usual GWAS. Um, so what we've been looking at in this work is thinking about how we can use uh, correlated variants uh, to help improve the power and robustness uh, of an analysis. Um, so if you were to use usual methods, this usually involves a choice of how correlated you want the variance to be. Um, so if you involve very correlated variants, uh, this can result in potentially um, uh, unstable estimation. Um, and in general, we find that results can be very sensitive to the uh, pruning thresholds uh, that you choose. Um, 
Um, so another way to go and the way we sort of think about in this work is try to exploit the correlation structure in single regions. Um, so these plots are about the uh, HMGCR gene, um, which is of interest for um, analysis of statins. Uh, and we can see from the uh, middle oh, plot that the... Interrupt you? Because we don't see your slides moving, actually. We oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me try again. Are they moving now? Yeah, that's better. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, very. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so in this work, we're trying to uh, explore the correlation structure in single regions. Um, so if you look at the middle plot here, um, this is where um, the uh, you can see the variant correlation matrix is, is very structured. Um, and around 14 factors are able to explain most of the uh, genetic uh, variation in the region. Um, so um, what we look to do, the idea is quite simple. Uh, instead of using individual variants um, as instruments, uh, we look to use a much smaller number of linear combinations of variants as instruments. And these linear combinations um, will be uh, the factors. Um, so in terms of notation, uh, this lambda is the uh, matrix of factor loadings. Um, so there are a lot of different types of assumptions in, um, in factor models, but. Uh, an important one here is as you get more and more correlated variants, uh, the number of factors needed to explain the, um, the systematic variation uh, is, is considered to be uh, much smaller. Okay. Um, so we can just be a bit more formal about our model assumptions. Um, so we work with a linear model. Um, the betas are the uh, variant effects. Um, if all the variants are valid instruments, then what we'll have is that the um, variant effects on the outcome will be proportional to the uh, variant effects um, on the exposure. Um, but in our case, because we're using factors as instruments, so these are linear combinations, uh, we don't need all the variants to be valid instruments. Um, we just need the factors to be valid instruments. Um, we also work with this assumption of uh, many weak variant effects. Um, so Essentially, what this means is if you keep adding more and more variants uh, at a certain point, um, they're going to stop giving you any additional identifying power. Um, so this could describe a situation of many weak effects, um, but also sparse effects are also covered under this uh, type of assumption. Um, so we assume that genetic correlations are described by uh, what is what's called an approximate factor model. Um, so these, this is a, a more general type of factor model than the classical factor model. Um, and a cost of this generality is that the true uh, matrix of uh, factor loadings can't be identified. Um, but you can only estimate this up to a rotation matrix. Um, but from the sort of perspective of efficiency, this doesn't really matter um, because you can imagine if you just multiply your instruments by a rotation matrix, uh, you're still preserving the um, explanatory power they have. Um, so in terms of sort of variance or, you know, um, how small the standard errors are, you're not losing anything. Um, and finally, we work with this uh, two sample summary data assumption. Um, so this is where uh, we assume that the uh, samples are uh, independent. Um, so this is just um, a very quick summary of the model assumptions. Um, so in terms of estimation, um, we're using factors. Again, we're using the, the genetic factors as instruments. Uh, and this will give us some estimating equations um, for the uh, causal effect. Um, so we denote this by G hat. Um, so there's been some previous work which has shown that using factors as uh, instruments can have advantages in terms of uh, efficiency, um, but also robustness to things like outlier effects. Um, but we still may be um, worried that we haven't completely solved um, the uh, weak instruments issue. Um, so why is this a problem? Um, so if we think about the way we usually construct t-tests, um, so we have this approximation that the t-statistic is uh, approximately uh, standard normal, but this is all under a strong instrument assumption. 
Um, under weak instruments, what you'll have is that the distribution of the um, estimate will depend on some complicated function of instrument strength, um, and so your t-test won't be uh, won't be valid. And you can see that from the blue plots on the right side. Um, so if you look at the top, um, that's where the factors are strong instruments, and you can see that the t-statistic quite nicely matches the uh, standard normal distribution. Um, but in the case where the factors are weak instruments, um, it doesn't really match the standard normal distribution. The tails are um, a lot um, heavier than uh, we'd like. And so this is going to result in an over-rejection problem, or in other words, you're going to have inflated uh, type 1 error rates. Um, so the usual way to deal with uh, weak instruments in practice has been to use uh, conditional testing. Um, and so there's almost a recipe we can follow to con construct these types of uh, conditional tests. Um, so we start by trying to find uh, the dependent structure between estimating equations um, and instrument strength. Um, and according to this sort of bivariate normal approximation, um, we can find that the distribution of estimating equations uh, depends on some measure of instrument strength, which we call nuisance parameters. Uh, and the conditional testing approach says, well, these nuisance parameters are a problem, so let's just condition on them, let's keep them fixed. Um, so we try to condition on a sufficient statistic um, for these nuisance parameters. Um, but this, if the issue here is we don't want to condition on too much information, um, because the more information you condition on, that stops giving evidence against the null, right? So, because uh, you're holding it fixed. Um, so if you condition on too much information, then you're going to have underpowered tests. Um, but exploiting this sort of bivariate normal structure, we can construct a minimal sufficient statistic uh, for the nuisance parameter, and we condition on that instead. Um, so with this, uh, we can construct two uh, mutually independent statistics, um, S bar and T bar. Um, so S bar will carry the information. Um, so this is just reweighting the estimating equations. Uh, so this uses the information of the factors being valid instruments um, and T bar um, uses the information on how strong the instruments are. And so given just these two statistics, S bar and T bar, you can construct loads of different conditional um, uh, tests. Um, so commonly used tests are quite simple functions of S bar and T bar. Um, so what we focus on quite a lot in the paper is the conditional likelihood ratio test. Um, so this is probably a, actually a more complicated function of S bar and T bar, but at least the distribution it converges to can be easily simulated. Um, and you can use this test um, even when the factors are very weak instruments, um, they provide valid inferences. Um, so just to relate things back to Mendelian randomization, so there's been some recent work um, which has used this types of, these types of conditional testing approach um, uh, in a polygenic MR setting. Um, our contribution, um, so we look at two different types of uh, tests. Um, the first are these types of um, conditional likelihood ratio or identification robust tests, where all the factors can be arbitrarily weak um, instruments. Um, and the second type of approach, which I'll discuss now, is more about variable selection, um, where we look to not just use all the factors, but we just use only the strongest factors and then try to adjust for the uh, selection process. Uh, okay. Um, so, so this is the second type of approach to so say it's more about variable selection. Um, and the motivation here is that you might just have a few strong genetic signals uh, in the uh, gene region rather than lots of many weak ones. Um, so some factors might well be uh, almost irrelevant. Um, so maybe the natural thing to think about is just discarding any factors um, that are weak instruments and just using um, the factors that are strong instruments. Uh, so we can just go one by one and test which factors are strong enough. Um, so if they pass some threshold of relevance, we include them uh, as instruments. Um, and the goal here is to try and control the uh, type 1 error rate conditional on selection. Um, so this is often called the selective type 1 error rate, um, and that's given by the uh, probability at the uh, bottom there. Um, so as with all variable selection problems, if you don't account for the uncertainty due to the first stage selection, um, your tests can be quite unreliable. 
Um, so how do we do this? Uh, it's very it's very similar to the conditional testing approach. So we again try and find the dependent structure between um, the pretests um, and the causal effect estimate. Um, so I've wrote the word approximately here, so it's not exactly the, as, uh, the asymptotic distribution, um, but it's approximately, it works quite well in practice. Um, so we can use this bivariate normal structure again. You can see, again, it depends on a nuisance parameter. So we'll try and condition on a sufficient statistic for that nuisance parameter. Um, so it looks very similar to the conditional testing approach, but the key difference here is um, now you're conditioned on two things. Um, so you're conditioning on the nuisance parameter, but you're also conditioning on the selection event, and um, whereas before you're only conditioning on the uh, nuisance parameter. Uh, okay, so this is the second type of test. Again, it's more about variable selection and um, trying to find the strongest factors, um, whereas before in the conditional likelihood ratio test, it was about including all factors, even if they're weak, uh, weak instruments. Um, so we can just look at a very quick simulation exercise to see how these uh, tests perform. Um, so this was based on uh, real data. Um, and just to mimic the problem of um, weak instruments, we just divided the standard errors by a small constant to just sort of inflate the standard errors. Um, and we're looking at the performance of three, three tests. Um, the first is just the usual t-test, which uses all factors as instruments. Um, the second test we look at is the conditional likelihood ratio test um, using all factors. Um, and the third test is just the selective inference approach that I just described. So we do some um, selection of the strongest instruments and then try and adjust for that. Um, so these are the uh, results. So we're just looking at the behavior uh, quite close to the null. Um, so if we start by looking at the very left plot, so that's the case where you, the instruments are, are very weak. Um, so this is for a 5% level test. Um, so you can see from the blue curve is well above 5% when the uh, true effect is zero. So you've got very inflated uh, type one error rates in the case of the usual t-test. Um, the selective test pulls things back a little bit. So the green curve is still has inflated type one errors, but not as much. Um, but the only one that truly controls the type one error rates are the, uh, is the conditional likelihood ratio test, because it is designed to um, be valid under uh, regardless of instrument strength. Um, in the middle plot with weak instruments, um, the performance of the other tests improve a little bit. Um, and in the case where instruments are strong on the right plot, um, you can see that for a 5% level test, um, the rejection of frequency is pretty much bang on 5% at the null. So everything controls type 1 error rates. Um, but I guess the interesting thing here is that the green curve is, is below the other two curves. So the selective tests uh, may be not as powerful as the other two. Uh, in this example. Um, and that's maybe because, uh, as we discussed, uh, this is the bottom bullet point, that selective test conditions on more events, right? The conditions on two things, uh, the selection event, but also um, the uh, nuisance parameter. Um, so the more things you condition on, you're going to sacrifice a bit of power. Right? Um, so I guess uh, the takeaway here was just that the conditional likelihood ratio test is generally uh, quite a reliable um, option. Um, if I've got a couple of minutes, I can just describe the, uh, 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 the um, uh, application that we looked at. Um, so this was, we tried to look at a SysMR analysis um, um, of interest for um, CETP um, inhibitors. Um, so we looked at 368 genetic variants in that region. Um, they were in, again, highly structured, so 10 estimated factors explain most of the uh, variation. Um, Pre-testing, so looking at the selective inference approach, only four of those 10 factors uh, were deemed to be um, uh, strong instruments. Um, so in this table, I've only recorded a few things. So the upper and lower confidence intervals at the 95%, uh, and Q is the p-value of uh, Cochrane's uh, heterogeneity test. Um, and I just want to focus on the uh, last four columns. Um, so this is a CLR01, CLR20, et cetera. Um, so these tests, the CLR, so CLR40, for example, uh, is this conditional likelihood ratio test 
which uses individual variants as instruments. So we're not using factors, but we're just using individual variants as instruments up to a pruning threshold. So CLR 40 will be a pruning threshold of R squared equals 0.4. Um, so CLR 80 will allow very correlated variants. Um, CLR 01 will be an R squared of 0.01, so almost uncorrelated variants. Um, and you can see from the difference between the lower and upper confidence intervals, as you move from left to right, um, you're getting um, tighter sort of confidence intervals. Um, so the results under the usual approaches are very sensitive to pruning thresholds um, and adding more correlated variants might give this sort of false sense of, of precision. Um, and looking at the p-value of the heterogeneity, I mean, I don't know how much stock you want to place on these uh, heterogeneity tests, but um, in general, I think they're quite useful to look at the coherency of evidence. Um, and you can see that for the CLR tests, um, which have um, uh, allow for very uh, correlated variants, um, it's rejecting uh, the null of that, the, um, uh, the, the variant effects are proportional. So you might have an invalid instruments uh, problem. Um, so this was just, I mean, this exercise was just to show that the usual methods um, with, with pruning can be um, uh, very um, sensitive to, uh, you know, user choice, whereas the factor model setup is quite robust. I think it's quite a useful um, uh, uh, compromise between efficiency and uh, robustness. Um, okay, um, I can leave it there. Um, the uh, preprints available online um, and the R code to um, uh, carry out the methods is available uh, there. And there's some references. Um, thanks. Thank you, Ashish, a very interesting talk. Um, one quick question for Ashish before the break. Anything online? Yeah. No. The results are online. Alison. There are no questions online. There was just a couple of comments about the slides. I think Zoltan has his uh, hand raised. Oh. oh yes, sorry, okay. Zoltan. If you can please unmute. Thank you. Thanks. Very nice talk. Uh, cool results. I was wondering how sensitive your method would be to a misspecification uh, of the LD structure. So I guess in your simulations, you assume that the true LD uh, uh, and the estimated LD are the same? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, in, these, uh, in these simulations, yeah. Um, in the paper, we've got a, a subsection which looked at um, uh, simulations when the LD structure was misspecified. Um, it does offer actually, you know, so. Um, and in that case, if you have uncorrelated variants or so prune to uncorrelated variants, that will be the safest option. Um, but um, the factor model, again, does a pretty good job of averaging out um, sort of measurement error type issues. So in that sort of situation, even an LD misspecification, um, the factor model maybe has some robustness to, to misspecification. But yeah, maybe some more um, work needs to be done on that. Thanks a lot. Okay, very good. So uh, let's thank all the speakers again.